for Premier Magazine. This is Ad Emmen reporting from the ISC Cloud and Big Data Conference in uh, Frankfurt. We are talking here with uh, Peter Coveney from the U UCL, who just uh, presented uh, the keynote. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Peter, can you tell uh, a little bit about uh, the topics that you told uh, to the audience here? The main message behind my talk has been the need to perform what we call very high fidelity, reliable predictions from modeling and simulation. These methodologies require high performance computing or they can't even get out of the starting blocks. And for modeling, we're talking about modeling uh, parts of the, of, uh, of the human. Yes, uh, the, the bigger picture here is the virtual human. There was a big EU initiative called the Virtual Physiological Human that ran in Framework Program 7. The main purpose of it was to introduce and demonstrate the power of modeling and simulation methodologies that have mainly come out of physical sciences and engineering and how they can be applied in the medical context to support clinical decision making. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do that kind of work, it's obviously all going to involve at least three dimensions in space and time. And anyone who does modeling and simulation realizes for the most part, such models do require high performance computing in any domain. But the additional problems that you'll face in helping to support biomedical research relate on the one hand to the fact that we're dealing with um, patient data, which comes with privacy and confidentiality mm -hmm. issues that aren't common in many areas, uh, let's say, of the physical sciences. And then, on the other hand, the need to produce outcomes or predictions on timescales that are relevant to a clinical decision. And these can be very short by comparison with what people are normally working with. So it's being able to marshal all of that in a very effective way that makes this a big computational science challenge in its own right. So, when I understand correctly, uh, you need to have almost real-time uh, supercomputing to get the, uh, the right decision or the right uh, model results to I the uh, search unit. The point is there's so many areas and ways in which computational methods can support decision making in a medical context. Certainly some of them are in the category you just described. Mm -hmm. I spoke in my talk about uh, supporting um, interventions that might be made in uh, brain surgery or it could apply in cardiac uh, surgery as well where someone is faced with a life or death situation usually they have to trust their judgment that's the clinicians with the experience they've already got but the pur purpose of these technologies is to support that decision making to enhance the outcome that might be it's in some cases life or death or mean that the outcome is much better than it would have been previously the patient doesn't have to represent and all these sort of things okay so that's one area but there are other applications i spoke of a, a different one where it's certainly very important to get the results, uh, this is to do patient drug targeting and selection. We need to get outcomes there in the space of one or two days. It's not as real time, so to speak, as the other application, but it's certainly much, much shorter than people are usually familiar with in these areas. I mean, yeah. People are talking about now at the cloud, and this was also a cloud yeah. conference. Aren't this, the, those things you can also do with cloud computing? Of course. Uh, the cloud itself is a moving feast. What resources one has available to use um, is a function of time because computing power increases as we just stand around here. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the main point though is that in order to get these results, very detailed high fidelity models in a very short space of time typically does require what we call the class of high performance computing applications. It means I'm going to be running maybe a single job or a large number of jobs that require maybe tens of thousands of cores and those cores need to be tightly coupled together and that's not what a conventional cloud today can provide so it's really the province of high performance computing but if they're going to be used uh, in a real context in a hospital in the future well i don't know a hospital that really has any kind of high performance computers to speak of today it's a question of whether they will end up buying their own capabilities or pooling resources and sharing on some firewalled, shall we say, private cloud that would still support a very large, you know, HPC device. These mm -hmm. things are all potentially possible. 
the um, it, so you mentioned the virtual human uh, project. Um, is there something going on today which is similar to that? Yeah, uh, th there is a virtual human in, sort of activity of a sort in the USA, but probably the the project which is most similar and has the highest visibility right now is the human brain project that's yeah. um, also EU funded and spanned at the, the tail end of FB7 and now into Horizon 2020. That's in a sense predicated on the idea that when you get an exascale machine, we don't have them yet, but we might see them in the early 2020s, it may be possible, uh, according to some people, to actually build a sufficiently high fidelity representation of a human brain that we will be able to understand better things like thought. I don't want to say consciousness because that's itself still a sort of deep philosophical issue. Uh, the Commission has just uh, announced the preliminary version of the work program for 2016-2017 and in that they uh, allocate about 25 million euro for a supercomputer dedicated to human brain. Yes. Um, so and probably that is because it, it needs to be, I mean one supercomputer is not the same as the other one, it needs to be kind of specialized. Right, uh, in the end when you come down to any particular application, I mean that in the technical sense of a code or a program that you want to run uh, repeatedly in the most optimal form possible because you understand all of the physics, shall we say, underlying it, then you have a strong argument for investing in a very specific technology because you know it's going to deliver for you. If you're still doing feasibility studies, the absolutely highest performance may not be so crucial. In weather forecasting, most of the meteorological offices that I'm aware of own their own computers and they choose them because they're optimized for their own purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned that you are participating in uh, uh, e-infrastructures like EUDAT. That's correct. Um, and what's the goal of, uh, of being there? Because our work does involve high performance computers and uh, those are distributed nationally, I come from the UK, but across Europe we have powerful machines in many European countries. We need access to those. Is a distributed nature to the infrastructure and the computers need data to be fed into them to start the simulations. And more particularly, they generate a lot of data when you run uh, jobs and that data has to be stored. And at the scale of a very big machine, those data sizes can be you know, easily many, many terabytes getting up to petabytes and that's not easy to move around. So you also want somewhere which could be local to those resources that stores the data. So you have data infrastructures that are now being put up uh, as well as supercomputing ones. And ultimately I'd like to see those things interrelated much more closely than they currently are. Mm -hmm. Because from our point of view we want them to be seamless, not separated with different goals and management structures. The question of the uptake of technologies, if we can call it that, of the sort we were describing for virtual human, this is fundamentally meant to be supporting um, medical, I mentioned clinical decision making. So there's still a large barrier there in terms of the education and training of the medics who in the end need to okay. champion these methods. Yeah. That's another big issue. Okay. Oh, of course, uh, all these uh, simulations, uh, how, how good they are, also depends on whether they are used uh, in real life by uh, by doctors and other medical practitioners. Uh, so what, what can you say about that? The first part of the question requires one to do a lot of work, much more than we would normally do on verification and validation, mm -hmm. to be able to be quite sure one's predictions are robust and don't depend on the particular circumstances of one person who ran a simulation. So that's also an essential component. But when these things have been achieved and you want to pass the technology onto the medical profession, they have to understand what's available. They need to know more than they currently do on their educational basis. So there's a strong view growing that they need to develop their curriculum to pay more attention to the role of modeling information technology and indeed high performance computing than they have ever done before. What we're talking about here is a big program. It's not something that, this is not being too critical of the EU, but you can't solve 
address and solve the virtual human in even a seven-year initiative. It's yeah, yeah. a huge yeah. agenda. It's the 21st century. This To be successful, it really has to be invested in for the long term. Yeah. And okay. that's something that's yeah. not, it's not clear how that's going to go yet. Yeah. How will, it, uh, will this, uh, this technology develop and how will the usage uh, develop? So at the moment, we've reached a stage where certain uh, medical procedures are being supplemented by this technology in a, in a mode of demonstration. But we're really at the very beginning, like the threshold of a new way of doing biomedicine. And it's something that requires mainly the rest of this century before we see all the fruits of these endeavors. Because the human body is immensely complicated. In the short run, we can pick up some early results. You could say low-hanging fruit. In the long run, you have to integrate all of this data and models. This is just an activity that's going to go on for decades. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, interview. You're welcome. For Premier Magazine, this was Ad Report.